Hi, my name is Sarah, and we're here to talk about surveys. And truth, <laughs> truth and data, and doing better quant for your mobile game dev teams. So I realized my title today was a little clickbaity. Um, I apologize for that. Uh, I manage UX research at Glue Mobile, and if you didn't know, Glue Mobile makes mobile games. I've also been known to write matrix questions. But yeah, on, the, on that note of the uh, clickbaity title, she said their survey sucked, and then she did this. <laughs> Today I'm gonna talk, hopefully, about something a little meatier than just telling you how to write better matrix questions. Today I'm gonna tell you how, at Glue, we needed to put more emphasis on our quantitative research methods. And I'm gonna tell you how we made it better, and how by making it better, we brought some data to our teams to build some trust with them. And then I'll go through uh, a few best practices. A little bit of framing before that. Um, so the user experience research team at Glue is uh, five of us now. And I spoke in 2014, and back then I was essentially a team of one. Uh, so we call ourselves UXR for short. And when I talk about quant, um, I'm talking a lot about in-game surveys where, you know, you see a, a pop-up and then that, you know, the player clicks it and then they go to your, you know, insert your favorite survey tool here, be it the SurveyMonkey or the Gizmo or the Qualtrics. Um, or I'm also talking about collecting outside sample, learning about your competitors. I'm talking about working with your analysts to do really good triangulation. I'm talking about the analysis that goes into it. And I'm even talking about recruitment. We put a lot of effort um, these past couple years into improving all of these things. And I also want it to be clear that I'm not up here to tell you that you should stop doing play testing or qualitative work. Um, you know, doing quantitative work is not to be in lieu of the other work you're doing. And we really see ourselves as a mixed methods team. Um, we have really made an effort to be the team that our game, our game studios can come to no matter what kind of questions that they have. So we really don't say, oh, that's market research, we can't do that. We don't want to turn any way, anyone away, we just add to our process. And we want to be the big brain, and we want to be um, you know, semi-embedded in the work, and helping teams answer questions at every step of the way. Um, you know, and, and you know, when they come to us with a question, we just come back to, to them with, here's how we think we can approach that. And we really value that. But why do we need to improve our quantitative methods? Well, this is really a coming of age story. Um, you know, like I said, we were just you know a couple user researchers um, up until 2016. You know, in 2014, it was just one, and we had 16 titles to support across like eight different genres for eight different studios, and these studios were located all over the world. So, not to toot our own horn but we really had to scale up, and I really think we did. So on the top here, you can see all of the, um, all of the studios and genres that we were supporting in like 2014 and 2015. And the, the, light, the light blue studios were the only, really the only genres and teams that were co-located with us. So we were supporting teams all over the place, be it in the Bay Area or you know, internationally. And then in 2015 and 2016, uh, Glue acquired more companies, and then there are just like more and more and more work for us to do. And so, when a company, you know, is a merger, mergers and acquisition type company, you have a big challenge. Every time a new studio comes on board, you have to build a relation with, relationship with them. And every time we uh, acquired a new company, each studio had a different level of understanding of their players. In some cases, We'd uh, meet with the, the new team and say, yeah, we already do lots of surveys. We know all about our players. In other cases, they'd just say, well, we're not sure. We think they're just all 45-year-old women. In other cases, they'd say, hey, we really value you use the research, but there's like only three of us. Can you please, please help? So we had to scale appropriately to get to know teams with, very, with uh, varying levels of understanding of their players. And even with the teams that were already here, we really had only established, you know, trust and some sort of process with, you know, one or two of those teams. 
So we also had to do more work to prove to our teams that user research is valuable. And we all know that product managers love numbers. So doing surveys and you know, starting, you know, helping them to scratch that surface of who their players are was really, really important. We also called ourselves a mixed methods team, but we were very, very lopsided. We really were doing mostly usability. And we didn't want it to be like that. We wanted to be able to do both. We wanted to be able to inform strategy, and we wanted to be able to inform you know, decisions on things like game balance and um, you know, content, etc. So we had to do one and two by generally just expanding our methods and like thinking about how we could help teams in different ways. And then finally, like the be all end all, like the, the, the golden nugget that we were trying to get to was this idea of um, creating a 360 view of our players with player profiling. And to be honest, I can't really take any credit for the work here, but uh, one of my team members um, has been doing some incredible work on player profiling and triangulating with our analytics data. And when I talk about profiling, you know, you know, we've all been pretty inspired, I'm sure, by the stuff that we've seen Nikki talk about. Um, you know, there's been great, you know, Immersive talks a lot about profiling, profiling, but, you know, I don't think I have to tell any of you here how valuable profiling is because it can just help you uh, build, build that sense of empathy, um, knock down assumptions, and inform all sorts of features, you know, on your roadmap, and you can help, it can help you start to, like, help teams put the player in their minds before you get to beta and you're just play testing. So we wanted to do all three of the above so that we could build the infrastructure and the knowledge so that we could start doing the player profiling work. So how do we do that? So how do we get to the point where we're now doing this work, we're, we're getting awesome questions from our teams? It's not just about like stats and pie charts. There's a lot of other things that go into it. And for us, you know, it was really this idea of communicating better, being flexible, um, putting focus on triangulation with analytics, our in-game analytics, standardizing some processes, if possible, automating some of the, those processes, and also giving teams access. If, I, if there's anything I learned in the keynote, it's that I should be writing shorter reports. So what do I mean, what do I mean by communication? I'm sure all of you have been in a situation where, you know, a team comes up to you, you know, if you work with multiple teams, if you don't, maybe you've never been in this situation, but a team comes up to you, one of your mobile teams, and they're like, yeah, we need a survey, you know, we've already written the questions, can you just like put it in the, can you just like put it in the game? I know you like have this tool called SurveyMonkey, can you like code these up? And call us in a week, or you know, write us a message on Slack when you get the results in. And of course, that's really not what research is. Research is about that reflective process. And for us, you know, we try to answer every question with another question. You need a survey? Well, why do you think you need a survey? Well, we've been thinking about putting in some new features, or you know, the exact say we need to put in some new features. Well, why did you start thinking about that? Well, you know, we really want to improve our elder game mechanics, and we want to make sure our elder players feel rewarded and don't take it down the game. Oh yeah, elders are the best. So, you know, what do you think your elders want? Like, you know, what do you know about your, your, your veterans, people who have been around for a while? Oh, uh, well, you know, we've been looking at the analytics and we have some ideas and, you know, we're not really sure. Oh, hypotheses are the best. Can you like write down like three to five sentences and maybe you have like three others and we can test them and compare them. And uh, maybe you can actually like sign your team up to like write three to five sentences. And, and I think for us, what we've discovered is there's never been a, a, a time when a team has said you've over-communicated with us or we, we don't want you to ask us more questions. Because long story short, we might have been the like, first team you know, of all the central services to actually like, ask and say, like, why are you excited? Why do you like working on the game that you're working on? And what do you want to know? This should really be the bulk of the work. Flexibility is really important too. For us, being flexible means that um, you uh, set up cam campaigns yourself. You find, um, you find some alternatives of how you're gonna get the survey data. So for our team, sometimes you're gonna be, uh, it's gonna be an inbox message. In other cases, it's gonna be an interstitial that's being popped up by 
the A/B testing uh, campaign tool. In other cases, we have we've had we've had to work with like the ad network. Um, and uh, another thing that's been really helpful for us is making sure that we work with our analysts to um, get data that we don't have to have, say, people self-report in a di diary study. So you know, only you can stop self-reporting. So make sure that you are working with your analysts, like when you set up a diary study and you're getting all that quantitative information, like and you know in advance how you're going to be able to keep track of those players, things like you know session time, uh, currency spent. And then I've told you a little bit about standardization and autom automation. Um, for us, it's just a matter of like, you know, we always hear, you know, we, we sometimes we work with vendors and they're like, yeah, you shouldn't use examples when you ask for genre. And other people are like, definitely use examples. For us, it's just a matter of like, pick something, stick with it for a while so that you can have some data that you can begin to compare. Um, start to build templates of your, uh, the way you ask for demographics. Have that live in your survey tool so that you can just add, you know, add your specific questions. And I think the most important thing for us is that we work really, really closely with our legal team. They are like, you know, like privacy is a user experience issue as well. So work with your legal team to make sure you're following all the laws uh, if you're collecting say, things like personal identifiable information. What we do is we put things like our um, user research uh, agreement on the web and we can always just link to that and that links to glues like privacy policy, terms of service, etc. Um, and then for automation, just think about the things that you can do uh, and do it in advance. So if you want to take net promoter score like every two weeks, um, or if you want to like poll for content, or if you want to create some custom scales to take, you know, to assess for game health, think about what you want to do this year and set it up in your campaign tools. Tell the team you're going to do it yourself, um, because the last thing a team wants is to hear that user research is going to be, you know, more work for them. Access has been really important too. We, uh, I can't take credit for insights.glue.com, that's been the analyst, but we are really excited to be using that to share like more abridged versions of our reports, and then we link to the full report in our SharePoint. So, truth and data, what have we learned? It's been pretty exciting these past couple of years. We have brought information to teams where they have been blown away knowing that like the age has been completely different, that games are more diverse or less diverse. They learned that, um, uh, Players in their games are um, not really even playing any other games. And doing this work has allowed teams to see that when you barely, you know, when you start to scratch the surface, you know, more questions arise. So we've been able to make the case for doing a lot more qualitative work as well because we're doing this work. Um, Net Promoter Score has been uh, really helpful for us. Um, basically, Net Promoter Score is a way to learn about customer satisfaction. Um, you get this really nice negative 100 to positive 100 number. We've mainly used it to learn about um, comparing groups within the game. We use it less to compare between our games because you know sometimes players are more meh than others. Uh, install path is something that's been really helpful too. You know, set up an automated survey so that you can uh, hit your players on day three and ask them how did they hear about your game. Um, Testing concepts has opened the door to us to actually informing strategy on business uh, business um, business goals, and so you know we've actually been able to show some previous work we did, which was a small quantitative study, and we've been involved now in licensing agreements, which we're super proud of that. Um, and of course, doing this work and having those conversations with your teams will allow your teams to start thinking about segmentation a little differently than just all those spender buckets. And because we've done all this work, we are now doing the profiling work. And this work is informing all kinds of things from actual feature design and uh, informing features and even just like small things like better usage of real estate. And you know, when, once teams start hearing about what you're doing for one of the studios, they're gonna tell the next or they're gonna see your work and oh my gosh, we are no longer knocking on anyone's door. We are now drinking from the fire hose. So just a few best practices. I want to make sure there's time for questions. Um, doing the profiling work has been great because now we can be really efficient in our recruiting. So we can work with teams depending on what sort of analytics back in and then we can uh, try to make sure if we want to say recruit a focus group, we can get the people we want. 
Um, keep in mind, work with your teams to know their feature roadmap. Because if you're doing those automated sort of surveys and you're, you're assessing game health, you want to make sure if there's like a dip or a rise, um, you can account for like those like weird results. Like I said, make templates. Make it templatize as much as you can. Things like your um, you know, genre, like gaming background, um, and all your demographics. And please don't ask about the future, even if your dev teams ask you to do it. It's really hard to ask someone if they're gonna buy something or if they're gonna play something. Um, but do ask about the past and ask about things related to the content that you might be making or the ideas the team is considering. And we're actually pretty, uh, pretty uh, um, uh, you know, when we do quality assurance, we kind of just, we're kind of lazy about it. So we work a lot with outside sample providers, and if someone does something that, like, they choose one of our red herrings, we just kick them out. And usually, what's really great is when you work with, with things like off-the-wall sample providers like Peanut Labs, they're usually okay with this. Um, and finally, make sure you always have agreed with your team on what your favorite comparison is. We love Candy Crush because it's so great to do a survey and be like, whoa! These people actually don't play Candy Crush. Um, and so if you have something like that to always compare against and, and show um, your teams like this group versus that group, you can have some good conversations about like what it means for those players to say play a particular genre. And don't stop there. I really hope that you consider doing more quant work. And I hope that doing more quant for work for you is just digging a foundation to prove your worth to all your teams and to you know, build an amazing research service. For us, it's been the knowledge bridge to connect with our studios and show them uh, some, some data that has you know, knocked down assumptions and gotten them a little bit closer to their players so they can start discovering some real problems. Let quant work be an opportunity for you to have conversations with the teams who maybe didn't believe that user research is value, valuable to them in the first place. And if through those conversations you actually decide not to do a survey, then I would say that you are doing better quant. Here's a few resources for you. Uh, you, know, you know, in a sense I'd say like our team with, you know, with each other, we're, we're our best resource. But we've even used things like Playtest Cloud to run some really small, really interesting quantitative studies. Um, I'm happy to answer any of your questions. I'm looking forward to talking to you all of you uh, for the rest of the day. Thanks. Hey, so, uh, can you hear So, um, the company, the, the lab I work at, does a lot of outsource work. So we're, we're pulling clients from all over the place, all over the world. And one of the things that I find, early on you said they tend to give you a list of questions they want answered. Not hypotheses, but like specific questions. And you, you talked a little bit about how you sort of push back gently on that, but if, a lot of the strategies you talked about seem to sort of depend on being having a relationship with them, which isn't always the case for us. Do you have any thoughts as to how to redirect those types of, of queries in a more useful way? Sure. So the question is, how do you how do you have a better conversation with the team that's come to you with something specific? For us, it's just been uh, following up with that with, hey, look, let's just have a longer conversation with what you actually need to know and why. Um, so we don't, so if a team does come to us and say, hey, like, you know, in some cases, teams have come to us and they're just like, yeah, we really just want some people to sign up for the VIP program and we want to ask them a couple other things and can you help with that. And in those cases, if you're like, if it's early on and you're just trying to build a relationship with that studio, we're kind of like, all right. But then we just try to have a conversation. Well, what are some features that are coming up? You know, what's something that you want to do or you've wanted to do, but you haven't been able to make the case to do that yet? Um, do you even know uh, like the demographic big breakdown of your players? So it's just usually following up, having a you know going there. Like so, you know, we have the team down in San Mateo, like just making the day to go down there and spend the day before you because if it's a really big, long, you know, quantitative survey. You don't want to be spending, you know, whatever, 6K, um, you know, finding out information that's actually not going to be helpful for them. Uh, thank you for this. Super interesting. Um, I'm wondering, what do you find is the best approach for uh, revealing findings to uh, a 
everyone that you do these surveys for, especially if you do a survey over time? Sure. Um, so, and I realize I didn't go a lot into analysis and reporting in this talk. So, in some cases, we'll just send an email um, and say, "Hey, here's like here's the the uh, here's the MPS scores for like this these few, past few months." In some cases, in some cases, we might just wait and bring it to like the QBR uh, for that studio. Um, and then we uh, we were you know we were pretty uh, lean up until now. We've had we've been able to get a bigger budget, so we've also improved our survey tools so that we can do automated reporting very quickly. And we just send we send the data like right away. And the data comes out, and we just say, "Hey, here it is." And then we say, "Here, you can look through everything." And then we get together, maybe a few days later, after we have all the survey data. And, and, and at that point, we're really instead just talking about the conclusions and what we're learning and ideas, and so that's more of a conversation. Thanks so much for the talk. Really interesting stuff. I actually really enjoyed that you um, talked about letting legal deal with uh, kind of informed consent. And that's something that I don't hear enough researchers talking about, is how you um, ensure that you have consent from participants. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more, both in terms of um, collecting personal data through surveys and what consent procedures there are for that, and then um, additionally, how much your team and user research team has in that role, or if it's just straight up legal. Sure. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm so glad you asked. So the question was about legal and how do we work with them and make sure we're doing the right thing. So um, we want to make sure that for, for in-game surveys, we want to make sure before we start collect, collecting their information, even if we're not, say, also um, collecting analytics data, uh, we have them agree to a user research program agreement and that lives on the web and we can link to that so they just say like yes or no if they say no we kick them out and that in that agreement it links to our privacy policy and the glue terms of use um and i want to go with like two in a detail because every every game you know every mobile game company is different and but basically what you want to do is you want to work with your legal team and decide what user identifiable information you're allowed to collect if you want to triangulate, say, like demographics with like their in-game behaviors. And for us, there's like different ways we can access that data. We'd like to, we, we're hoping to be a little more automated there, but you know, usually it's a matter of just like collaborating with our analysts to um, look at, say, like behavioral data alongside the survey data. Um, I hope, hopefully that answers the majority of that question. I really, really enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. So my question about doing better quants is about connecting behavioral data analytics with surveys. Can you say a few things more about that? Yeah, sure. So um, the main work where we've been doing a lot of that is within the profiling work. And my colleague back there, Natalie, you should find her later today. She can tell you all about the awesome work she's been doing. Um, and that's where, you know, if you've seen some of the work that, like, uh, has been spoken on a couple of Gur summits back from like Nikki. We're we're thinking a little bit about clustering and we're we're reading about pre best practices. I'm really excited for the talk later today. But basically, we're looking for you know we just try to find like groups within our games where we see some um, similarity, and then we usually also do qualitative work as well. So we're not just leaning on the quantitative work. So we're doing user interviews in addition to that. Um, so that we can paint a really, really detailed picture of who these people are, so we can go broad. So there's like the tree and like the roots, right? So we're just trying. We're just trying everything. So the more we do, and the more types of data collect, the more we know. And are there any other questions? I really appreciate all of you guys coming, and have a wonderful. First Summit 2018.